But despite the modern weapons, men were still being trained in old-fashioned ways. American troops made dummies of bundled corn stalks for bayonet practice. And attempts to prepare for new obstacles like barbed wire were inadequate. British infantryman Walter Hare thought his training was useless. It wasn't a scrap of good. I learned how to salute officers, which seemed to be the main thing in the army. I learned to slope arms and, and present arms, which you can't do in a muddy trench. I fired five rounds before I went out to France. I never saw a grenade. I never, see, I never saw a machine gun. So I was a rookie when I went to France. Walter Hare was part of the British Army that was now joined with France and Russia against Germany, Austria-Hungary and Turkey. There were fronts to the east, south and west. In the first months, the experience of war for ordinary soldiers was little different from previous wars. A succession of rapid marches took the Germans across Belgium into northern France where the French and British tried to stop them. But after only a few months, it became clear that this was a new kind of war. In a rare piece of film, British cavalry can be seen moving across open ground as they'd always done, but they'd come into the sights of new long-range German guns. The camera was rolling at the moment the horsemen were struck down by distant, undetected enemy fire. Modern artillery had become so powerful and accurate that tactics had to change. Both sides were forced to take up defensive positions. For millions of soldiers, the central experience of the war would change into a long and bloody battle of attrition. Both sides started digging trenches all the way from the English Channel through northeastern France down to the Swiss border. The British and French on one side, and a few hundred yards away, the Germans. As the front lines were strengthened and completed, networks of support trenches were cut across the countryside. Signalers laid telephone wires to link the front with the artillery and headquarters behind. In this half-buried war, defending a position was much easier than taking the enemies. It was the start of a long deadlock. Men kept below the parapet, but each side watched the other constantly, and snipers peered through their steel spy holes to shoot anything that moved. The Germans believed all they had to do was stay put on the territory they'd taken. They dug elaborate bunkers to protect themselves from the shelling and waited. Cut by hand or with power drills, their human burrows could go down 150 feet with several levels. There were underground kitchens, sleeping quarters, and sick bays. Some had electricity and water. They were much better organized and harder working than we were. 
We were an offensive army, whereas they wanted to hold on to what they'd got. They'd built tunnels, which we saw when we were advancing. Each one housed 40 or 50 men. They were really plush. Parts of the front were quiet for months at a time. A French private wrote, We have become waiting machines. For the moment it is food we're waiting for. Then it will be the mail. After that, we'll be waiting for something else. In the early days, of course, there were so many boring days and very little fighting. I used to do a lot of sketching. It filled the time, and I got ideas from whatever happened the day before. A listening patrol would be sent out occasionally to get as close as possible to the German trench and to pick, pick up any sort of information that might have been given you by Germans talking amongst themselves. And one just thought of a German champing away and making a noise while he ate. Behind the lines, teams of butchers, cooks, and bakers labored to feed the soldiers. Oh, hell, what bloody big lumps of beef! Oh, hell, what British Empire troops were supposed to have fresh meat regularly, but most days it was canned stew, corned beef, and dried biscuits. The German soldiers' food was poorer. They always had army bread, but other supplies were cut as the Allied blockade of German ports tightened. They had to supplement their rations as best they could. Quarter was always hunger. There were a lot of horses killed, and of course then we had a lot of horse meat. It looked funny when there was a dead horse. A, a troop passed by, and ten minutes afterwards there was nothing but the bones left because everybody put a piece of, of, of meat into his pocket to cook in the evening, or give it to the goulash gun, to give it to the fellow who made us the soup, and the soup there was mostly dried uh, vegetables, which we called barbed wire, it was so hard. But if you put a piece of meat, of horse meat in there, it tasted after something. It was a battle of industrial might as well as manpower. The ordering and transporting of the guns and munitions took military planning and logistics to new levels. At the height of the war, the Germans had over 20,000 heavy guns with a network of repair centers to maintain them. On the Allied side, much of the heavy work was done by colonial troops from South Asia. They were used to the heat of the summer, but had not experienced European winters. The hardest time was when we were at the station and it was snowing. I had not seen snow before, it was unbearable. Some people just froze up and had to be carried away. We put on four layers of clothing, then a big coat on top of that. But with all these clothes on, we couldn't work very fast. 